Uh, good afternoon, fellow citizens. Uh, welcome back to the Citizens Chat Show. My name is Masisa Demiano, your show host. Uh, thank you for always uh, following these conversations here on the Civic Space TV, on the chat show. We always stream live on our uh, channel, YouTube. Kindly be part of these conversations. Subscribe uh, your comments out there, your conversations on our hashtag uh, chat show UG and Civic Space UG. Hashtags are uh, quite uh, encouraging and empowering for our country and for these conversations to keep going. And that's our intention to bring you all these uh, events as they happen around the country, informative as they, for, for you to be informed and uh, for us to do something that would probably change uh, the course of action in the country. And uh, today, like uh, any other day, uh, we have a topical uh, uh, conversations that we bring for you and uh, uh, we're discussing uh, today the situation analysis of uh, poverty and uh, uh, deprivation in Uganda. Uh, you boss, uh, just a uh, a few days ago released uh, a report uh, where it said uh, about 17 million uh, Ugandans are under what they uh, they termed as multidimensional poverty. Uh, that means that uh, they are not able to afford a meal, they are not able to, to afford health care, they can't uh, take their, 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 their children to school, and the general uh, lifestyle is, is, is not good. And uh, to discuss this and much more, I have uh, a team of uh, experts that uh, will help us uh, uh, put a uh, good weight on to, uh, to this conversation and inform us. Uh, joining the panel today uh, is our usual uh, suspect and uh, uh, panelist, uh, the government, uh, retired Major Awich Pola. Uh, uh, Afande, you're welcome. Thank you, our good host, and thank you. Viewers, I greet all of you. Yeah, uh, Afande is uh, the director of external services with the NRM, uh, and uh, he's always proud to, to say that. Uh, and, uh, following uh, Afande is uh, uh, the economist, uh, senior economist, policy researcher, and uh, this is his area, uh, Dr. Fred Mohumza. Uh, Dr. you welcome. Uh, thank you very much, and our viewers out there, we send you greetings and best wishes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Doctor, for honoring our invitation. It's a pleasure. Uh, this is your maiden appearance on the Civic Space TV, uh, on, the, on the chat show. On the chat show. But uh, Civic Space TV, you are raised uh, with us. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for always honoring our invitation. So it's an honor. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, the lady in the house is uh, uh, Joanna Nasuna. She's uh, in the programs uh, at uh, Siatini on the uh, Women and Economic Justice. Uh, Joanna, you're welcome. Thank you, Domian, mm. and thank you, viewers, for being with us. Yeah, thank you, and uh, you made an appearance uh, on this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for, for being with us. And right into the conversation, I would want to bring on uh, uh, a professor, uh, because this is area. His area. Uh, just uh, uh, the pronouncements uh, early, uh, a few months ago, uh, a month ago, so, uh, where the president really went out and made a pronouncement that Uganda is now finally in the middle income status. But uh, we are seeing uh, statistics and uh, reports coming out from you, boss. Uh, this this, uh, this uh, pronouncement was highly contested uh, with, the, uh, with the World Bank and many of you actually who are mm -hmm. in this field. But uh, now we see statistics coming out from you, boss, here saying 17 million Ugandans are into the, uh, a multidimensional uh, poverty. And this also means that... Uh, uh, the most of these don't survive up to six thousand Ugandan shillings a day. Uh, do you think that the president was right to make such a pronouncement? Of course, um, the president follows the information given, the statistics, and comes out of the the same Uganda Bureau of Statistics, mm -hmm. uh, which was able to say we have divided our current level gross national gross domestic product by the population, and we are. 1,046. Mm -hmm. The threshold is 1,036. So they provided that information to the president. Mm -hmm. So he's reading what has come from the technical teams. Mm -hmm. And the, now the whole conversation actually went back into the technical teams. Because the World Bank comes in to say, no, no, wait a minute. I don't use gross domestic product. I use gross national income. Mm -hmm. So you use the wrong indicator. Now, that's not a conversation for the president. Mm -hmm. It's for the technocrats. Yes, technocrats yes. So what is the difference maybe for our viewers out there? Gross domestic product is what has been produced within a year, within the country's borders. Now, you're trying to attribute what foreign companies in Uganda have produced inside Uganda, mm -hmm. but does not actually belong to Ugandans. 
So you want to avoid that because you might overstate certain things. Mm. This company is MTN. Some shares are for Ugandans that would be left in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Some shares are for South Africans that I don't know who else they would take their money. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to capture that. That's why the World Bank says don't use gross domestic product. Because mm -hmm. there is some income there that is not for Ugandans. But you're also missing some income that belongs to Ugandans who are out there. Mm -hmm. So for them, they use gross national income. Which means wherever Ugandan is, whether in Uganda or mm -hmm. outside Uganda, <laughs> their money they have earned, they put it together. And they apportion it to the Ugandans. Mm. So already you see two different uh, reports yes. that will not be debated because they are completely different. The second thing was on the population. How many are we? Mm. Are we 43? Are we 42? Are we 47? No statistics. No statistics. <laughs> and again, there it is projection. Mm. Because the last census we did was 2014. Now this is 2021. Mm. So everybody can project depending on how they look at it. Mm. But that's why now this other conversation of the multidimensional poverty, which is 2019, 2020, mm. comes in to say, but what exactly is the fee? You guys debating whether we meet or not. What is the status of Uganda? Yes. And you don't want to follow the one indicator of income poverty, which puts 20.4% of Ugandans as poor. You want to add more dimensions. Mm. Because we don't live only on income. The income I earn must give me the value that I need in life. Mm. My utility or my satisfaction or my enjoyment is not just the money I have. It is what this money delivers to me. Mm. And that's why the multidimensional comes in to say what kind of house are you in? If your house accommodates more than three people per room, mm. you are poor. If you do not have a toilet facility that you can use for sanitation and wash your hands with soap, you are poor. Now, mm. those kinds of things can move up and down because, as you know, now soap is expensive. So maybe there was even somebody who had soap, now can't afford it. Mm. That person has dropped into poverty. Their income is still as it was, mm. but now they can't afford the soap. And physically, it's not there. So those multidimensional things bring in other aspects. Are children in school? Mm. Are they completing? Are they getting quality education? Are you food secure one meal a day or three meals a day? You may not be dying in our eyes and Karamoja. Mm -hmm. But there are so many other Ugandans who may not be dying, but they are not settled where they should be when it comes to food security. Mm -hmm. Even if you have had your meals, but there is uncertainty about the next meal or the meals for the next day, that person is not at peace of mind. Me and you will be comfortable because you know you will eat even in September, the whole of June you will eat. Mm -hmm. Children are coming back this week and next week. There is somebody already worried. Would my child go back to school? They are not sure. Mm -hmm. That's why you want to add from income poverty, what about the other dimensions? Mm -hmm. And that discussion, I think, is a very good one and healthy. But we still work in progress. I, I still will have an issue as a, a person who knows Ugandan households are diversified. You find somebody here is having food, another is not having food. This one has water to bathe, the other one has no water to bathe. Or to drink, they are drinking just water from a pot. Mm. So the samples we are using for doing our household surveys, statistically, academically, they are okay. Mm. Uh, in the 2016-17, I think we used about 16,000 households. Mm. The 2019-2020, we used about 14,000 households. These are small samples, knowing that Uganda has eight and a half million yeah. households. households. Mm. You cannot generalize. Like I can come to major here and pick a drop of blood and test for malaria. It will tell me about the whole body. But surely in terms of household dynamics, you, you are not answering that question by that small sample. Mm. I know surveys are expensive, which is the reason we are saying under the parish development model, let's not go sampling. Mm. Let's go universal. The community information management system should pick as much information about this household. Do you have land? Is it yours or you are leasing? Mm. And how much is it? How many children do you have in that home? Because I want to be worried, should you subdivide your land to your children? Your children are going to be poorer than the parent. Just because the parent had five acres, he has ten children, now each one of them is ending up with half an acre. How do you address that at policy level? Mm. So we certainly need more information to generate more multidimensional aspects. But I must end by saying uh, 
This is not the first time we are using multidimensional poverty. Mm. 1997, there was a project in the Ministry of Finance, and they chased all of us who are economists. They said, you, you think of income poverty, you think of numbers. This is qualitative. The Uganda poverty, Participatory Poverty Assessment Project. Mm. Let the people participate in assessing themselves. So we got the definitions. Who do you consider poor here? And you'll be surprised those records are there. Mm. The issues they brought. You found rich people also becoming poor mm. because they had court cases that could not be resolved. They have the money, they are wasting their money, they are spending their money, time is going, judicial systems are not in place, they would say the courts are very far, I can't reach them. And some of these informed the reforms we have seen in the judiciary, trying to put more courts mm. nearer to the people, thanks to some of the, not the donors, the Danes, I think, the Denmark, put in some money for us to build these courts. So when you see these courts spread out there, mm. part of it came from both the rich and the poor saying justice is so far away. First struck the justice. Police was so far away. Mm. I remember Northern Uganda, jealous police. You'd find it's a, not even a UP. Because it has been provided by a donor to respond to a community need who said, when we call the police, they can hardly reach us. And when you go to the police, we have no vehicles. Mm. We can't reach them. So then the government responded. So these are some of the good things that are coming out. Mm. When you take a multi-dimensional approach, you understand the problem better. You design your response better. Mm. Community policing came in. Kasija now is writing from the community mm. to community policing Policy. and back to the community. Mm. Those are information pieces that came to say, policing is about the communities. Mm. LDUs was really our own community fellows. Forget sure. about what has happened these days. But they are still serving that particular core interest. Mm. Can we have security nearby? Those were voices people raised. Schools are very far. Teachers are not there. Unfortunately, 25 years down the road, the same conversations are still with us. But at least the information is known. Mm. We might fail to respond. Interesting. Either. And uh, uh, do, uh, Dr. Right there, uh, the minister just uh, in, 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 at the launch of uh, this report, came out and uh, you've talked about uh, uh, the fact that I saw the first time you, you're hearing about my dimension approach yeah. and from from uh, government itself uh, being excited about it yes, and saying that uh, that really helps them to understand where to now uh, focus their attention. Uh, but also in there, uh, the UN representative uh, mm -hmm. here say, came on and say that uh, Probably the gov government should really channel efforts on uh, industrialization, probably if they created more jobs, mm -hmm. then some of uh, these could be, whilst people have the jobs and uh, can take care of themselves, uh, some of these could be averted. Uh, do you see that uh, that could be the best way? Because now government, is still the first time they're talking about this, yeah. uh, and uh, it seems like it's failing. Can't we now get the approach of saying, a donor like that, says, we use industrialization, could be the way to go, other than relying on, a, say, a parish development model like you, you talk about. Yeah, I think as we've said, uh, it's multidimensional. Mm. Now, you don't expect uh, a multidimensional problem to be addressed through a unitarian kind of approach. Mm. The solution should also be multidimensional. And I've seen that conversation. No country has developed without industrializing. Mm -hmm. But we should for, not forget that we are at different levels of growth. We can leapfrog. Mm. But let's not remember that, forget that even the countries that are industrialized today, many of them had an agricultural background. Maybe that's where we still are. Mm. We don't have to wait 200 years. We can shorten the period. But surely you have to first see where am I? Mm. How do I get out of where I am? You might only get out of there by actually, first of all, picking the next two decades to intensify agricultural investment, to get people out naturally, mm -hmm. but also to set the pace for the industrialization. We're talking about the agro-industrialization strategy. These are agro-based industries. Industries are gazolers of resources, meaning you must have massive production mm -hmm. in the agriculture to support that industry. So it's neither this nor this. Industry has a role to play, but we should not forget the role that agriculture. So we are seeing an agricultural country. Mm. The current food shortage speaks to that, that we haven't even succeeded in securing our own food security. Leave alone what you want to give to the industries. Mm. Because the first harvest goes to the family and to the community yeah. and the neighborhood. It never even reaches the industries. Mm. And in the case of Uganda, we are integrated. South Sudanese, Kenyans, Rwandans, and DRC people come straight to the farmer. 
and they bypass that industry. Now, until all those fellows have bought what they need for their food this week and next week and the other week, the industry may not get it. Now, remember, you are saying industry will add value and we can increase the shelf life. That is if we have allowed that food to reach the industry. People may buy all the milk and put it on their bicycles, go and consume it that day. Fine, you could have converted it into UHT and it lasts three months, mm -hmm. but you never even had that opportunity to get it to the factory. So we need to say agriculture should be part of the strategy. Industry is part of the strategy. Services are part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. And we're in a very good condition here where Ukraine and Russia are really demystifying the people who think agriculture doesn't matter. These are industrialized countries. Russia makes jet fighters, makes tanks, makes all sorts of things. That very many of is in an industrialized country. Mm. Same thing with Ukraine. But now the whole world knows about these two countries for food. I can appreciate wheat. We can't grow wheat in many places here, but soya bean, mm. sure. Sunflower, these are our foods. We do them here. So why don't we say, fine, we are going to do agro-industrialization, but can Uganda be known the world over? for these three crops, yes. or these five crops, yes. which are agriculture. But these now bring in inclusiveness. In economics, we say households actually create the market for industries. And in Uganda, we still have that distortion. Every time an industry has a problem, you want to give money to the industry. Mm. In the developed world, they give money to the household. Because you give that money to Joan in the morning. In the afternoon, she goes and lines up at the factory mm. to buy a mattress. Then the factory receives the money and produces more. So it's a question of conceptualizing in a sense that does not undermine agriculture. Mm. We need to make sure, because that's where your households are. That's why Uganda still is at this point in time. But it's also a way of getting out. But never forget agriculture. Like the whole world is now realizing. We overexposed ourselves. Russia and Ukraine produce 70% of the world's weight. Give me a break. That's too much exposure. Enough. What if Enough. it wasn't one, it's just a weather mm. problem. But the world never bothers. Even us here, we need to be looking into these things. How do we take advantage of the region? Mm. How much food is needed? For me, even to think about agro-industrialization is a good conversation, but can I fast feed? It's a big market. Mm. It's a big need. Ugandans, South Sudanese, DRC, Rwandans, and Kenyans. Tanzania seems to have found a solution. They rarely import food from us and instead we import from mm -hmm. them. So can I draw some lessons? So that's for me, and it will address the multidimensional aspect. Yes. Because you find the biggest areas, by the way, when you look at this multidimensional poverty, Karamoja, you would expect that because even income poverty is poor. Guru and the Lango subregion, you can understand because even the income poverty, they are poor. But now you are beginning to get into geographically, climate ways, these shouldn't be poor areas. Yes. If you had emphasized, agricultural investments. Mm. I can understand failing agriculture in Karamoja, but in Lango and Guru, and as you continue, the Vinyoro region mm. is also in the line of the poorest. Yes. Sadly, Toro. Kigezi. And Kigezi. Yes, the so guys. Now, where mm. I can exempt Karamoja, mm. Kigezi, Toro, mm. Bunyoro, Lango, <coughs> and Achori, and the Soga. is a clear signage of our failure mm. to invest in agriculture. It's mm. no longer a weather issue. Mm. I know, don't tell me agriculture, irrigation, and what. That's another extreme. But for now, can you use what is available? Oh, so I think this speaks to a number of things that we need to do. Evaluate our previous policies. Where have we gone wrong? Mm. Don't blame Karamoja for the weather. Pinyoro and Toro, Kigezi, mm. Guru and uh, Lango. Uh, yes. There is more to think about policy matters. And that's the beauty with this kind of study. Yeah, interesting. And uh, I, I, in there, we want to bring in uh, a funder. I found the, uh, like the doctor has just said, there, there are clear ways through which we can really avert some of these uh, uh, statistics that are, that are really uh, clear to us. Uh, and uh, in there, when, uh, when uh, the NRM just came on, uh, they started uh, to, to power in 1986. Of course, uh, the economy had collapsed. Then you st they started with uh, the economic recovery program. And in there, they, they had... Uh, the, the, the push on infrastructure development. Uh, we've seen several programs later that uh, morphed into some of uh, these interventions that have been uh, out there, including bringing on the NADs, uh, uh, ministries being uh, broken into now, uh, 
agents where you have a, a, a say narrow then you have all these these agencies trying to see to it that uh, uh they, they can capture some of uh, these these uh the economy in its way uh, service provision and all this but still then we are having a problem of of uh, services reaching the people but also for the economy to pick up like it's supposed to be where is the problem is it the governance is it uh, the policy people is it the will uh, thank you so much well, thank you, Doctor. I enjoyed listening to Doctor. I almost thought he should have talked to the own program. <laughs> the last time I had economics was in high school, in military school. Mm. I enjoyed it. I passed it well, but not at this stage. As you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm more looking into this thing. I look at it more from rights-based mm. approach, mm. how it factor in into the rights of the people. Um, I also thought you'd bring in the lady because the few occasions I'd had, they're really so expert it's in their area. Mm. I've met a few, a few here. But anyhow, well, now that you bring me him, mm. in, let me answer your question. Um, I've been there at the time that you are aware, I've been there since the inception of this government. Much as I was a baby, a cadogo, but I think I was. The political education in the NRA then was enough to make me pick what, what was happening. Mm. So I've seen right away from taking over power up to now. Uh, and of course, as I said earlier, when I went back to economics to study it, back to the military school where my senior father was a lieutenant already, I could now see the applicability of what was happening and what was in the classroom. So, many attempts have been made from the economic recovery, the infrastructure, indeed, as you said. It went into electricity. You had President Seven fighting in the parliament, all this of electricity, the roads, mm -hmm. Kampala Road was not as it is. And uh, so, electricity, roads, factories were attempted. And it rolled over to even saying that government is not good enough to do this. Let's privatize it so that we bring the private sector to do it. Mm. And it came on, of course, with the World Bank IMF policy there. A lot of fighting are made to do things better. Now, more so at the household level, so many programs have come up under the office of the prime minister. Mm. Uh, sometimes in, at a national level, but also at times at regional based. Several ministries were created under Prime Ministry for Northern Uganda, for Karamoja, to be region specific and have uh, other things which were issues or thematic concerns which are also specific. But as you said, all these have not yielded. Mm. So the, the, the answer as to what, what is wrong yes. becomes difficult because yeah. if you really see that uh, the goodwill was there with the various attempts made. So it therefore exonerates the government at the political level for the goodwill, mm. meaning that all the times are made. If goodwill was not there, why? Now, uh, I'm thinking like you are thinking. Mm. Maybe the experts would have an answer. But I'm thinking that uh, part of the problem is the, the dynamicity of the society. As you plan and put things in place, the reality keep you in check. You may not holistically plan. You plan this, and you leave an item, and you're, you're, you're off. So that is one aspect. The other aspect is matters outside the country. Mm. You can't be planning, for example, to think that you'll raise income through coffee. Mm. And then in there, you are stuck with external market. Mm -hmm. So these are factors outside our mandate. Uh, of course, also in there, these 36 years, because we started from the beginning, is that insecurity also pervaded it. A lot of insecurity. We have had a lot of civil war, which ordinarily uh, was a factor in eroding, not necessarily in the whole country, 
mm. but eroding all these various multiple times that were made. That was also a factor. That you had all from West Nile, almost during La Quena, up to Maga Maga, here in Jinja, which was under war. So if you're taking a holistic period, then you have that factor, that insecurity also brought in. Also other factors is that the inadequacy of capital. Time and again, the resource envelope was not enough. Government would have wanted to do that enough, mm. but it is always not enough. Then you ended up in borrowing, and as you borrow, the cycle continues. Uh, uh, also, let me mention that while all these are factors that affect, also there's, there's the, the element of the discipline of resource managers. Mm. Many times we have put resources into the hands of the concern, like you really want to prove right to health because you're going to measure poverty in terms of access to health services but the person doesn't do this the right thing mm. or build a school as an aspect of it so uh, in my opinion that discipline in the hands of resource controllers also affected all this multiple approach because if you ideally check out resources that are put out for these projects mm. and if you had a camera that could actually see how many or how much really went to the specific aim and objective mm. or targeted people. You find there are lots of leakages or lots of the resources that mm. are put in. So, in brief, and therefore, my opinion is that... Couldn't it be a governance failure to check some of these because they, sometimes they are out, clearly out in the, in the eyes of everyone to know that this is failing because of probably this, these individuals, this, because of this, this approach, but you, you realize there's less attention or no action most times uh, that is done to some of these. Well, depending on how wide you define governance. Uh, uh, and let me also add here that I tried to list, in answering your question, mm. list of factors that affected this. Mm. It was not exhaustive, though. Mm. You may want to put governance, but I don't think I did it, I did the omission uh, without conscience. I think I delivered it, did sit there, because the wider definition of governance would maybe crystallize to say, if Museveni was not there, it would have been better. Mm. Or if NRM was not there, if you take the wider uh, governance. But if governance, you mean to say, the direct direction one gives mm. to state management, I think the state has done its best. For example, if you talk of resource control, lots of political will has been seen that it is advice. Two, legal machinery has been put, several legislations have been put to sanction this. Three, institutions have been put in place like the courts to try, the prosecution to prosecute, the investigation to investigate. Four, institutions like uh, IGG has been put in place. And then further, awareness raising, policies, positions have been put. So if, as far as governance is concerned, on my long list, which included corruption, I wouldn't put governance. Mm. Because I am part of the ruling party, and I'm part of those who see manifestos that are implemented by government. Because we have a contract with the people through a manifesto. Mm. And we win election and we form government. And government executes our manifesto. It is very clear in the areas of governance and in the areas of do's and do nots. So the political will is there. So my omission on the list of factors when I was answering your question, mm. my omission of government <coughs> was deliberate. Because in my opinion, I think governance is in place, and that is why we are not a failed state. We are a very democratic state with laws in place, with institutions in place, governing the, the entire geographical re region of Uganda. Not even a single inch is not there without the presence of the state, hmm. and a democratic one. So I deliberately did not <laughs> list governance for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Afadi. Let me just bring on Joan. Joan, uh, 
Uh, statistics, of course, show that uh, children and women are mainly affected when uh, some of these come out. Uh, you realize percentage, the biggest percentage of the highly uh, affected uh, are either women or children. Uh, where do you think could be the problem and the challenge in this? Um, we look at a situation. Mm. Maybe let me go a bit back by talking a bit about Siatini yes. giving a preamble. Mm. So Siatini Uganda that I work for mm. is an NGO that works on trade policy advocacy mm. for pro-development trade, investment, and physical policies to ensure that policies that are available create an enabling environment mm. for the citizens, for the vulnerables, and that policies are fair for all. So as we address policies, we also note that policies are such an important factor to support economic development, mm -hmm. but also to address issues of poverty that you're talking about. And then we also look at the fact that the people who at the end of the day are marginalized the most and are impacted on the most by these economic situations we're talking about mm -hmm. are still the vulnerable. You find that women are children, you'll find the youth at the end of the day are impacted on the most. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that as we discuss these technical issues, they still come down to the household. And the person at the household level is the woman and the child. Yes. So we talk about yes. the recurrent, recurrent economic situation that, he, that is happening, whereby we started with mm -hmm. the COVID-19 pandemic which really hit households by a lot, but also impacting on uh, women entrepreneurs and women-led businesses mm -hmm. by a lot, by about 64% compared to the 24% impact it had on the male-driven businesses. Mm -hmm. But also after the prolonged lockdown that we're in, that really impacted on all of us somehow, now we went into the hyped fuel costs, but also the hyped basic commodity prices mm. that as well impacted on still the same people, the women and children, but also, of course, the men are also part, but the person who is, who is affected the most is the woman that we, we represent. So, um, and here we are talking about the global economic crisis. So, the fuel costs cannot be addressed. Mm -hmm. The basic needs, commodity prices that are being hiked as well cannot be addressed. But then as we shift and we are still in that era of hyped fuel costs and commodity costs and how to address the gaps, now we shift into a climate crisis mm -hmm. of drought in Karamoja that ends up claiming about 900 people. And then now we shift again now to the floods that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. So you will see the recurrent economic shocks and crises that are impacting on the country. And at the end of the day, the person who will suffer the most is the woman because of the role that she plays. Mm -hmm. But as we talk about um, these crises, we talk about poverty levels. But I think we should also not just... Um, use the, t the terminology of poverty, like Dr. Say, but let's talk about impoverishment. Mm. That these people are being impoverished, the more it's just a deepening factor into this kind of economic situation, whereby we see aggregate demand reducing. Again, we see it reducing further. Mm. We see, um, we, 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 by the end of 2020, uh, according to the UBO statistics and World Bank statistics, mm -hmm. they had said that um, the poverty levels were 20%. And by the time they read the national budget, they said now they had been lifted to 25% mm -hmm. poverty level. But now again, we are saying that 18 million Ugandan citizens are falling back into poverty. Mm. So that is one that is now not leaving, leaving anyone behind. We see impoverishment even taking the rich. We see people parking their cars mm. 
mm-hmm. to be able to, to, to manage the current situation, even the rich parking their cars. But then when we talk about the stakeholders suffering in this, we see the country itself that is increased in indebtedness, but also we see the person, the normal citizen, that is supposed to address the indebtedness through heavy taxation, yes. yet they cannot afford their businesses are not in position to pay these taxes in a season whereby government actually would be waving off or providing some incentives. But we see the president coming out and say, I cannot do that. Mm. Don't expect any incentives because it is those taxes that we expect to pay the debts. Mm. There's no way we're going to pay the debts. So, uh, so that is a situation that we are looking at and we see that people are very frustrated Um, but also frustrated in a way that they do not, they are not cushioned in any way. Yes. We see, um, we, we've had quite a number of government interventions that they put in place to respond to the economic crisis Mm. during the COVID-19 interventions. And, um, the ripe one right now is the parish development model. And this one will address the woman mainly because it goes down to the household level the lowest person. But then we look at the interventions that we are put in place before the parish development model, like the Small Business Recovery Fund. We look at the Emioga Fund. Mm. And here we are, we are telling people, all right, because when you talk to these uh, people in economics, people, people who are doing business, they will tell you that what we need right now are the markets, and the finances, mm. because we have a challenge in capital. But then when you respond, you're like, no, but there are these government interventions in place. Government has provided finances <coughs> to support the small business recovery funds. Go to this bank and try to access this money. Mm. And they will tell you, last week we were having the MSME week where Siatin was in collaboration with Federation for Small Small and Medium Enterprises. Mm. And one of the feedback and responses from the MSMEs was that we have been to the banks, we ask them if we can be able to access these loans, they tell us, yes, we have the money. Mm. And how long will it take? Less than a week you would have the money. They do the paperwork, provide the collateral that is needed, complete the paperwork, and then the back and forth starts from there. Mm -hmm. They cannot access this money. And why the banks have become so reluctant doing this and frustrating um, frustrating government interventions is that at the end of the day, they are not held accountable. Mm -hmm. We see government not holding the implementing financial institutions accountable. We see the people not having... Uh, redress mechanisms, no no structures in place for them to seek remedy. Mm? Mm. But also that that limited accessibility and stringent conditions frustrating MSMEs, but also frustrating women to access by a lot has also really impacted on, um, on the economic situation, but also the limited redress. Mm. So, um, We feel that, um, okay, like we know that Uganda is now a neoliberal economy and uh, they keep telling us that, you know, we can't address some of the issues because the economy is is totally driven by factors of demand and supply and, you know, that is, it is, and, and the moment we give incentives, we are distorting the market somehow, that's not the best approach. Yeah, we hear all of this, Mm. but really in this economic situation, when we look back and we look outside Uganda, we see countries giving their their, 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 their participators, their stakeholders incentives. We see them giving them support. We see quite a number of interventions that countries and government put in place to cushion the economy. 
from the deepened marginalization. But we don't see that happening in Uganda. <coughs> we don't see that happening in Uganda. And it is the role of government. Mm. However much government says that their resource envelope is low, mm. it is their role to provide. Mm. It is their role to prioritize public service delivery rather than paying off of loans. Mm. And it is about time that government sits and, I mean, addresses the issue of increased indebtedness. Maybe it looks at debt justice, renegotiating the terms and conditions. They are taking up loans that have high interest rates. Mm. And then the people they are focusing at, the MSMEs, the people in the environment, because even when you don't look at just the business participators, we look at the indirect taxation of VAT increase VAT on basic products. So that means even someone who is not in business is somehow impacted on by the indirect taxes yes. at the end of the day because there is an increment. We also look at Uganda having the highest VAT on the ESC region block mm -hmm. at 18%. So at the end of the day, this is impacting on the household. We look at URA all the time devising means of broadening the tax, tax base. The yeah. tax base. But who is the person supposed to pay for these taxes? It is this person mm. who is impacted on, who is impoverished, who is, who, and now people are, are living the cars, even the rich themselves that we called, that we deemed rich, mm. I, as well have loans and are failing to pay. Loan repayments have becoming an issue now. We are looking at people leaving their cars back home and taking border borders. We are looking at the border borders, border border guys even also stopping to drive. And now where will the money come to even pay off the loans? Mm. So these are the actual... There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a picture of something that I saw where a border border man burnt himself because of, because the, of, yeah, because yeah, of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the, the state of the economy. Mm. And that is the impact on the people, on the citizens that government expects to collect the taxes from. So um, as, as, as this economic situation, government should be realistic. Mm. They should not address the situation as the way they, or, or you know, there is a way in which they ignore situations. Mm. This is serious. The prices are increasing day by day. We have a whole ministry of disaster. What is the ministry doing? They should be disaster preparedness. I think I studied that way back when I was still in secondary. I thought there's a ministry supposed to be addressing this. We don't see this ministry anywhere. Mm -hmm. We look at a budget that is being read. And again, there are so many rumors going on that actually the money financing the budget is also not there. So we look at a, a model being put in place, parish development model, it's going to address the people, but we just see one, they, they, are, they, are, they are very open about um, the money, the credit facility that Ministry of Finance is offering, the mm. loan facility. That money is very clear. Mm. So what about the other pillars? They are talking about the pillar of financial inclusion, how it's going to address and, 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 and by the way, these pillars are all assigned to different ministries. Yes. But they've not talked about the monies assigned to those pillars. How much money is assigned for mindset change? Mm -hmm. How much money is assigned? I mean, you need to be clear so that at the end of the day, we can follow up. We can demand accountability. We can hold the fine, uh, the, 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 we, we can hold the different implementing institutions accountable. Mm. So as government comes out, we need at most transparency in government interventions to see if they are working, but also if they are not working. What is, I, I mean, how are we holding, what is the penalty mm. for them not working yeah. for their a finance, I mean, for the accountable institutions handling. But also, in case they are not, where do the people go to seek remedy? Mm. Where do the parish people go to tell the government that actually we didn't get the Emyoga money? Or someone came and registered. Remember the ghost circles? Mm. Where people came and said someone came, sat us here, and then they took our names and our signatures, and they told us we are getting the money. Where did that money go?
and and at that time when they were investigating, I, I really were really those people held accountable. Mm. So to make sure that actually these programs work, to make sure at the end of the day that people feel involved and included, mm? Mm. government should take up such roles of holding institutions accountable, accountable. Mm. but also penalizing them for not implementing. Mm. So at the end of the day, that discourse between interventions and implementation shall be addressed. Yeah. Mm. Interesting, John. And, uh... Most government is listening, so we we, we, shall not, we just need to have a, a very short break uh, 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 and return in this conversation. It's going to be deep. There are some uh, areas that are probably we also need uh, our economists, senior economists, to 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 respond to in line with uh, with uh, this uh, topic. Please be part of the conversation. We are still on. We are streaming live on uh, Civic Space TV. We are on uh, Twitter chat show UG on the Civic Space uh, TV hashtag. Uh, drop in your comments, uh, follow the conversation. Let's hear from you what you're saying and I probably could also respond to that. Uh, let's have this conversation going, but uh, we'll return in a, in a short while. Thank you. The Citizens Chat Room happens every Friday at 2 p.m. on Civic Space TV online on Facebook and YouTube. We invite you to be part of this conversation. Civic Space TV, freedom always. And, uh, uh, I want to bring in, uh, of course, uh, joined today was is uh, Dr. Fred Momoza, uh, 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 my my sister here, uh, jo jo Joanita, and uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, I found a witch who who are helping us understand this. I I, I, I just straight to to doctor. I, I we've just had some conversation that triggered me uh, uh, a little and. Uh, I want to ask if we we saying that, uh, for example, the budget was released, and uh, uh, important to it is that uh, much of it is going on to debt repayment, uh, and uh, we have little that could probably could be in circulation to mm -hmm. to allow us uh, uh, implement. Uh, now you have a report that is coming out telling you of seventeen uh, million people multidimensionally affected with poverty. How can we utilize the, these little resources yeah, mm. to ensure that uh, probably we could do much to, to, to at least fix some of uh, the shortfalls that we have in the country? Yeah, thank you very much, Damian. And my colleagues really have raised important issues mm. to keep this conversation on the right track and delving into why are 17 million Ugandans poor by the multidimensional indicator? Mm. About to almost 8 million poor by the income poverty alone. Yes. And the, a number of the multidimensional indicator even shows you that those who are not poor under the income, about 17% are poor under the multidimensional. Mm. So how did we get here? How do we get out of here? Yes. It's really the conversation that we have dug into. Mm. And... Uh, I find here raised quite a number of issues. There are things boxes we have ticked. Mm. But in economics, we call them necessary, but not sufficient. Sufficient, yes. Thank you for conceiving. But now how do we make sure? Because conceiving alone is not an easy thing. You mm. don't take it for granted. Many people do. But there are people who can't conceive. <laughs> yes. But after you have conceived, how do we make sure? This is anti-NATO. Mm. But even after delivery, thank you very much. Many don't get there. Mm. How would we raise this child? And doctors will track these things. One year, infant mortality. Then five years, child mortality. Mm. You want to monitor progress. And it's very good that the, the government has ticked very many boxes. But now new boxes are emerging. Mm. <laughs> and as he mentioned, these are not for the original domain of the military, the way we knew them, the people who were in the bush. Mm. They came to bring peace in the country. Mm. Now, everybody in the poverty of the 90s and the early 2000s, in Northern Uganda, because of the war, mm. these guys ticked that box. Mm. Now we are saying, good one, is it rain? It's not rain. Mm. What else haven't we picked? And they mentioned very important things of corruption, discipline mm. of the implementing people, which for me are governance issues, really. Mm. Somebody steals public funds and continues. You see one or two, what is happening in here? So there are new boxes that keep emerging. And that's the beauty with economic development. Why do you think you have solved this? There's Something new, new pops up. Mm. Then another one pops up. Mm. And you're supposed to remain alive. 
So how do we mean agile to resolve these problems? Yes. How do you mean, especially with scarce resources? And economics is really about scarce mm. resources and competing needs. If that was not the situation, economics disappears. Mm. Oxygen is not an economic problem under normal circumstances. Mm. But the moment we get to a hospital and there are people who need oxygen, you realize the cylinders, the machines, the money goes up because it's not an economic issue. Scarcity for those particular individuals. How do we address this to uh, uh, give the scarce resources to priorities? And, and priorities, avoiding wastage. Mm. And priorities keep changing. Mm. And uh, one of the things for economic planning needs to be medium to long term. You want to avoid a situation where you'll find that as a decision maker, mm. all the decisions you wanted to make have been made for you. In other words, you are incapacitated. Mm. You are like in that traffic jam, you can't go back, you can't go forward. You wish you had not made that turning on that one-way road. Muhumza here, it is very rare to find me on one-way roads. Mm. Because I want to have my options. So I don't want to be on useful at certain times of the day on certain days of the week. Mm. But now, unfortunately, as you've said, because of previous engagements with debt, mm. debt is a certainty. And you've been measuring it by debt to GDP, which is a wrong indicator. We have expressed our views on it. People continue to do with it. Even up to today, you find it in government documents. Mm. Our debt is sustainable because we haven't reached 50%. I'm like, no, you don't assess debt in its own space. Mm. The cost of debt in economics, we say, what is the opportunity cost? What else will do you have done with this money? Now, if you have six trillion interest payment, eight trillion rollover, that's already 14. Mm -hmm. You have almost 3.2, 3.5 that is going to the other multinationals. You have domestic debt, what we call arrears. You have all these obligations, they are court awards, they are the lawyers. And unfortunately for court awards, the, it keeps piling up interest every time you don't pay. Now we have uh, certificates of those who have delivered goods, which are real arrears. Mm -hmm. And remember, these are private companies that are failing. You gave me a road to build. I have borrowed money from a bank and put the road in place. I present a certificate. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have money to pay me because you must pay the debt. Now you begin to see the opportunity cost. That's the true cost of debt. Teachers genuinely come and say, surely 300,000, 500,000 for a nurse. Mm -hmm. Can you give us at least lunch allowance? Mm -hmm. This nurse is not asking for anything more because she's on duty from seven to seven, hands over to another who runs the night schedule. She can't go and farm, she can't go and dig, she can't go and look for food like me and you can. Mm -hmm. So she's asking, give me my lunch allowance. You are not able to. Right. Those are the intricacies that you get into. And I can hear Joanita here saying, government has a duty to help. Yes, we know. Can it? There are mm -hmm. certain government with flexibilities because they have fiscal space. The American government, the German government maybe can. Kenyans, I'm waiting to see how they will sustain their decisions they have taken. Mm. We've seen them take political decisions. I can understand they are going into politics next week. Mm. So certain decisions in Kenya, you don't want to copy them. Yes. They can only be rational in a political voting moment of tomorrow. But logically, they may not be the right decision. So I think Uganda is still taking that conscious decision to say, I don't want to commit where I can't. But also there is where you will say you are coming from. You are going to hear big subsidies in Europe. These guys, winter is coming. They have to heat because if you don't warm up where you stay, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So the state will certainly come in and subsidize energy for the survival of citizens. Now, nobody should come and say, but the German government and the French government offered these benefits on fuel. Why shouldn't Uganda do? Their situation is different. You can't do without fuel. Mm -hmm. You're not only heating the room you are in, even where your dog and donkey sleeps, you need to warm it up. And if you don't, the entire economy and livelihood and people will die. Mm. So the context is also critically important to understand where we are coming from. So do we have the money to do it? Certainly some things we can, some mm. things we don't. But also our context is speaking to different things. So we want to understand our situation better and respond. Mm. But as we respond, there's a terminology when they brought liberalization, <coughs> market forces. The terminology is have minimum government, but maximum governance. What are we saying? On the roads where we drive, there is minimum government. Mm. 
You can drive from here to Masaka, you will only have met traffic police in very few places. That's government. Mm -hmm. But there is maximum governance on that road. The lines that say keep left, keep right. Will allow me to meet a huge semi trailer in my small car. If governance was not there, and this guy says, I have my car, I can decide what I want to do, mm. how many would die on that road? Government is minimum, but governance is pronounced. maximum. Mm. And it's a market force. We decide where to pass, but following the rules of the game. So, can we have government concentrate on governance mm. so that me and you can predict? Mm. I've taken my child to school. I haven't seen them since visiting day. What is happening? I know they are there and they are telling me they are getting holidays next week. I will gladly go to pick them because I'm trusting the Ministry of Education that gave a license to that school. school. I am trusting the Ministry of Education and National Curriculum and everybody who developed the syllabus. Mm. I've never seen the teachers who teach them. I've seen a few. The class teacher I see. But who teaching the other subject? I'm trusting mm. that the Ministry of Education, which accredits teachers to teach in that school, that's maximum governance. Mm. But minimum government. government. I never see the Ministry of Education. I don't have to. But they are put in place policies and procedures. And that is his cry. Can we have the people implementing government projects and her cry be mm. held accountable? That when they misbehave off the norm, the system triggers. Mm. Otherwise, we're not going to solve these problems by debating and making proposals. Yeah, true. Proposals and policies are implemented by institutions. If you have a weak institutional environment, forget about development. Mm. And I think that's Uganda's core problem. Corruption symptom of failure of institutions. institutions yes. That somebody knows I can steal public funds and get out with it. I can do a shoulder roll and get out with it. Mm. Why do I have to know which doctor is treating me? Me or I know, sign of H for a hospital, yeah. branching. Tell them I'm not feeling well. I will find a nurse. I will tell her my story. Sometimes they are labeled, sometimes not. Mm. But that's institutionalism. She will get my story. I will see a doctor, go to the pharmacy. I will pick my drug. I will go back home mm. and I will feel fine. I always want to tell people the security. I don't know which soldier is in charge of my security. But I can tell you as night follows day, my expectation 100%, I'm is going to drive out perfected. of here mm. and go to my home. That takes a lot of police and intelligence work to make sure all the criminals who are planning, not just against me, but against the citizens, as you said, government is felt everywhere. Mm -hmm. There are forces behind there. We don't know their names. We sometimes never get to see them. But their impact. We see. Mm. That's what you want to get to. The other day we were in a conversation, as I end, really it was about production. Mm. And people were saying, where is credit? Can't banks give money? Government should give money? No, I listened to the Grain Council. They said, for us, we are discussing with the banks. This is Baroda. Baroda has invested heavily in the Lango sub-region. Mm. Stan Bick has invested heavily. And they said, for us in Grain Council, we have organized the farmers. We know what they need. Mm. We have now gone on their behalf to stand big, signed arrangements with their circles. We are talking about PDM. Mm. Circles are here. Not... Stand big knows where the circles are. And they are trusting them because they are being organized by the people who would buy from the farmers. So I can even lend them, knowing clearly somebody is going to buy from them. Mm. So that activity is happening in northern Uganda. Stand big is sending a lot of money out there. Sentinel is sending a lot of mm. money out there. But that would not have happened 15 years ago. If the guys in uniform had not resolved the people in IDPs and the corn roaming around. Interesting. Uh, uh, Professor, you, you just talked about how much is invested in that region. But it's on, in the statistics, it's one of the poorest. Yes. With, with, uh, and actually, in, in, uh, in the figures here, show that uh, the Acholi region is... Uh, uh, Karamoja actually, actually is actually the first 68%. But because still... that's the point of the, what the multidimensional brings in. Mm. As you're saying, development is multidimensional. It's like a football team. You need everybody on the pitch mm. playing their role. So if the banks and the producers are putting money mm. and agriculture has come out, what do people spend this money on mm. to improve their welfare? 
So if I'm going to earn a million shillings from selling soya bean, selling cattle, selling milk, selling coffee, and then I can't get the health care service mm -hmm. because that side is not working. I can't get basic education for my child. I can't get the road access mm. to the markets. Th then you have not covered <clears throat> the multidimensional aspects of this person. And that's why we're saying Paris development model, please, government officials, stick to the seven pillars. Because mm. I know everybody thinks Paris development model is financial inclusion, money to circles. People who receive this money, who is going to give them the planting material? Who is funding the agro dealer? As I've told you, the people having conversations with Stanbic are not farmers. What are those seven, Doctor? The seven you're talking about, the first one is actually agro-industrialization mm. within the program of major national development plan. But you're looking at agricultural production, you're looking at processing, you're looking at storage, mm. you're looking at the marketing. Now, within that pillar, so many other actors and as I say, me as an, ag an aggregator, I want to buy maize, I want to buy soya bean. Mm. I don't grow it. But I'm going to talk with the bank to finance those who grow it. Mm. And give the bank assurance, I will buy it. There, so the pillar one will be covered. And doesn't require government money. A little bit of it, but the private sector is ready to roll. Pillar two, you are going to be talking about what we call economic infrastructure. Mm. The roads, the energy, the water. Very important. Mm. for survival. If you give people money and they plant and they can't have a feeder road to sell their produce or even to get the inputs in, they are dead. Now, feel like pillar three is this financial inclusion. Mm. The money. And everybody looks at the money. Mm. Pillar four is equally critical. It touches the issues of health and education. Why does a mother want to grow cabbages? To sell and educate her child. To sell and treat her child. Mm -hmm. Now, entities like BRAC have discovered that the people I lend money to are not progressing. Why? Because every time they sell a goat, they treat a child. Mm. So they will never multiply the goats. Every time they sell goats and cows, they pay education. Mm -hmm. Because education, if education was free and working, if health was free and working, this farmer would actually come out of subsistence farming. Mm -hmm. Because by selling their maize, they would buy more land, mm -hmm. they would invest and diversify, buy a bicycle or a border border. But now every time they do this, they go back to pillar four, which government is assuring us is free. free. Mm -hmm. But it's missing, partly because of debt, partly because of governance, teachers are absent. Why are they absent? Don't blame the teacher. You need to get into their shoes to hear what they go through. 400,000 can't feed their family. So they spend more time farming or doing border border business. So mm. comprehensively address that pillar four. Then you get into things like pillar five, where you have this mindset change. How do we arrange people? How do we organize ourselves literally? And pillar six will be talking about community statistics, which is what I hinted on. Sometimes you want progress. Every time doctors are watching, they take your body temperature. They take your, mm. is he eating? Is he, they want to monitor progress. They take your pressure. They do so many things they do there. So even if you are saying, can we get a feel? Where are the farmers? Are they making a choice? What state are they in? And then critically important, seven last but not least, as they say, governance, administration. Do you have the sub-county chief in place? Do you have the town clerk in place? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have the extension service provider in place? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is the cow's office functioning? Is the police working? So if you miss any of these, you cannot talk about the Paris development model. Mm. You're talking about a downgraded version, and you can be sure the result you're going to get, downgraded. Children don't pass senior four by passing one subject. It is out of eight. Mm. Even as you go into A level, three subjects are still needed. To get into university, minimum two principles. Now we are here dwelling on one subject, <coughs> and you think you'll produce grades. So I can tell you as light follows day until the PDM Paris Development Model goes back to that design, <coughs> every effort is going to be yeah, failed. Mm -hmm. It will be failed. I don't have to wait for time to come. If the patient is not healthy and we see it in hospital, you go telling them I'm sick. They will say, first thing, you are anemic, blood. Mm -hmm. They haven't even given the treatment for the sickness. But the, the dose will not work if you have no blood. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The dose will not work if you have not eaten. So glucose, 
to paint of blood, basic fundamentals before we even administer the drug. So we are saying this economy, before you even send any money, can you alongside deal with the others? And I hear people say, did we pilot, do I need to pilot primary education? It's part of the PDM. Do I need to pilot feeder roads? It's part of the PDM. And we are thinking of non-money related solutions. Some districts do not have road units. Mm. Yes. Some districts do not have road engineers. But do I need an engineer and a grader for every district? Some districts, given the money we give them, in one month they would have done all their roads. Mm. <laughs> their budget will be depleted, all their roads are finished. So why shouldn't that grader go and support another district? Now if you are going to spend more money buying more graders for every district, then you will have no money left for fuel. You haven't connected the dots. Mm. So we need new ways of thinking that are economically informed to say, I have a minimum budget. How do I allocate it? So there was a conversation to put this road construction equipment at regional level. Mm. So that no district owns them. But even sometimes you have unilateral graders and engineers. They are doing a unilateral road. But what is wrong with them helping a district? Why the but, three months they spend? But Professor, I want also to... to, to, to uh, sorry, I'll, I'll still come back to you. I would want to, to know, you've talked about the roads. Yeah. And uh, most times, uh, infrastructure, the roads are, are, are some of uh, what's probably... The, the government and those that are in the economics talk about as the drivers to, to, to growth. Uh, without a doubt, if you look at the local government infrastructure and uh, development and road uh, uh, units mm -hmm. and the improvements, uh, uh, Gulu itself and the old Acholi mm -hmm. area has literally the best, one of the best uh, road networks. But one would still come back to us, uh, ask that question. Why is it that it's still ranking yes. as one of the areas that are, are really not scoring so highly in, on this development chart? It's back on that dimension. As you said, footballers, you can have your Ronaldo and you don't get a trophy. Mm. Because it's not just Ronaldo that wins. The others must win. Mm. Now, one of the interesting things really, sitting down with friends at Operation Wealth Creation, mm. Military guys, I like them because they gather intelligence that me and you will <coughs> For you will be basic. Tomatoes are flowing in Guru. The tomatoes in Guru are, bo are planted in Imbali. So why can't Guru produce its own tomatoes? Yes. Mm. They have the weather, they have everything. everything. So you realize that the infrastructure in Guru is not supporting the communities in Guru. It's actually helping the communities in Imbali and elsewhere to sell their interests but not the communities around, which is what we call inclusive growth. So you want to come back and say, why isn't Guru producing tomatoes? And by the way, when we break down inflation, mm. the towns now, they are cities that top inflation because we don't just do the national, we also go to centers. Mm. Mbale and Guru are always competing. In we July, Mbale had the highest level of inflation. Wow. While me and you are talking about uh, <laughs> 7%, 7.8 national level, mm. those places are in double digit already. The two places. So if that begins to speak to your poverty levels, because Guru will always have highest levels of inflation in the country, mm. and you can understand why. Partly it is a transit right. route to South Sudanese. The South Sudanese guys sometimes don't know the value of money because they have their money from gold, from wherever. Mm. But that alone raises the cost of living. You can't just walk in and buy a chapati. You can't just walk in and do X, Y, and Z. But you want to understand those dynamics. How are they hurting the population? Mm -hmm. Are they the ones selling the tomatoes, the rice, and the what? You'll find they are not. So how does that inform government agenda? Why are we doing the sugar factory in Atiak? Is that the best need for oh, that community? Good. Knowing what sugar has done to Busoga. Fine, they have good land. But why don't I use it to grow soya bean, mm -hmm. simsim, rice? and maize to feed the DRC, Sunflower South Sudan, and, this, and yes. themselves. Mm. And that's why you come back and I say, minimum government. You, Mr. Government, can you let the private sector decide what will be done in the Guru sub-region? Mm. But you find government is bringing the wrong project. You are trying to do an industrial park in Guru. To process what? Let the private sector 
be involved in these conversations. Mm. And sometimes we don't listen to them, but also even when we listen, sometimes we're in company with the wrong private sector. With all due respect, I have seen private sector fellows who are not private sector. They are literally targeting a government grant or an allocation. What conversation did the Mandela have with government? Isn't he out there, Mandela Millers, giving us the best that you can? <laughs> Where there is an opportunity, the private sector will pick it up. The moment I find the private sector, which is saying, Mr. Government, why don't you hear that guy you want to doubt? Is he only looking for me? A real genuine private sector mm. does his thing. What did the roofings ask from government? Mm -hmm. They put up their thing out there. Look at Kaweri Coffee. And there are very many other private sector people have met. They are not even asking government for land. They go to the communities and negotiate. Mm. I want to do macadamia. And they made these guys, I want to go and visit them. Their macadamia is nice and they're exporting. Mm. They have outgrowers. So they didn't grab people's land. They didn't invest in buying land. They just told these people, this is what we want to do in this area. Because geographically, it fits. Mm. And they went into their own conversations. All they're asking from government is security, feeder roads, and a few other things. Health facilities for our people, education schools for which government does in its own sense. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to get back to that level of minimum government, maximum governance. Then the rest will flow. Your markets will work. Mm -hmm. But now some markets are missing. Some are so much interrupted. To the extent that I cannot evaluate whether it's a market problem or a government problem or another problem. Mm -hmm. Because I can't blame markets. They are not there. Even where they are, they haven't been allowed to do what they would want to do. And that's the challenge we are having. Look at the health sector. Doing well, Nakasero Hospital, what did they ask from government? Maybe a few support things, but they have responded. The pharmacies in this country, mm. I like that sector. All that government is doing is regulation. National Drugs Authority. Mm. The pharmacies are all over. You want a tablet of 200,000, they have it. You want one of 2,000, they have it. Yeah, you want one of 200, depending on the need, but the market responds. Mm. So how can we make sure government is like National Drugs Authority? You just regulate the quality. Mohums, I don't know the quality of those drugs. I just walk into a pharmacy with a prescription. Mm. But National Drugs Authority, who are pharmacists and medical personnel, have made sure what I'm about to get. It's the work. standard. That's mm. all I need from government. I don't want government to come and set up pharmacies. Mm. The market is working in that space. Can we have that work elsewhere? MTN, Airtel, mobile money. People are keeping almost a trillion shillings on the mobile money servers. Confidently, no longer under their mattresses. What is the trust? UCC has done its job. Bank of Uganda has done its job. Mm. Criminals are still there. But every day we are cleaning. Minimum government. I don't know who manages the money on people's phones. You don't have to. But it is safe. And can it be safe? We've even seen people do that. I'm coming from Guru to shop in Chikugo. Mm. They load their money from Guru because they don't want to move with cash. So you see them actually when we search the systems, money was loaded in Guru or loaded in Chikugo. This person was really looking for safety of their money. And now we have a lot of people doing payments to Meme, do, do payments for water, you pay school fees, school pay. You don't have to do the platform is secure. And what to give credit to government? But say these success stories, can we extend them elsewhere? Because mm. now you are giving the markets a chance to allow people to do what they do best. Can you imagine the problems we had to go and pay school fees? You give it to the student, the child eats it. You give it to a relative, he eats it. it. Now I don't have to have that hassle. Mm. Every child has an arm on school pay. So, Doctor, I'm going to bring you back on, no on, on some area. I just want to, to on, on, on that same aspect you've brought out a very good uh, analogy minimum government and maximum governance yes i i, I want to to invite in uh, uh, uh on, on on this area how do we ensure that there is there is uh, this minimum government you've brought out from nowhere we have the parish development model we don't know we are yet to know how much it will it will respond to to the needs because of course we have already uh, the history of, of some of uh, the initiatives that, uh, that, uh, that have not performed well, NADS, all these. So we want to ask, uh, could it be the issue of uh, putting wrong people in these sectors? Well, uh, 
In my view is that it's not a one item problem, mm -hmm. the multiplicity. <clears throat> of course, if you start from policy level or even legal level, there's a common joke that uh, Uganda makes very good programs mm -hmm. and it is implemented in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And it is a success story. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. you have systems in place or you have ideas, but uh, to have maximum governance and minimum government is that you, you want to have an ideally a, a, a well-governed system. And well-governed system is by having laws in place because mm -hmm. we don't exist in vacuum. Like the case of the, the road to Mbara or to Masaka, mm -hmm. you have traffic road laws and all drivers on the road have in mind that there is the do's and do nots. If you do this, the sanction is there. If you don't do this, the sanction is there. So in effect, you're being governed mm -hmm. by yourself because of the conscious knowing of the do's and do nots, the legal system and the policy system. So, uh, we can have that. Now, to say that programs have failed for wrong people, I already alluded to it, that we don't, we, it is one factor that we don't have discipline. We have always had people who are not disciplined uh, to the extent that uh, the resources that are <coughs> thrown out for a particular thing, for example, if you talk of uh, a specific item like uh, you want to go to Gulu and you want to eradicate poverty and you want one IFA mm -hmm. per family, and it is estimated the number of people who should get that IFA. So you have either to you find in the end that you have a third of the, the full number actually getting the IFAS, two thirds have not, or even the prescription of the quality of the IFA given say, it must be say 22 months mm. or whatever duration that the experts would have prescribed. Some people will buy much younger than the month. Mm. In this case, it's part of the discipline. So the people have actually bought the wrong IFA and the wrong quantity mm. and yet, the projection would have been that if you gave this IFA to every family, it will either pr produce milk for the children or increase in numbers and they love, it will impact on their wealth. So you don't have it. So that is what I was saying. So that is in implying to, to the, your proposition mm -hmm. of uh, putting wrong people. So we have the people there and I already alluded to their display. But also, uh, we are coming to realize that which is a really escape route that people will, some persons in authority would say the act of nature. The act of nature in this case, we're talking of the climate, mm -hmm. we're talking of this. I, I don't know whether it is my wrong assessment. It's almost becoming evident that the seasons that we had when I was young is not the seasons that is. Mm. Especially in area of predictability, mm. everybody would know that in from March you will start planting millet, mm. and in July you will kind of be harvesting. No more, no, no, not more the case. So you can't now predict actually where you are going to plant your millet. So mm. in in a, in a way, therefore, that becomes a factor, and uh, we have insisted that government, Madam puts it that government has the mandate. The mandate rests in, in governments and whether act of nature or what, it's your duty. Mm -hmm. You went for election to seek the mandate to do it, so please do it. So how will you remedy it's your problem because you have the mandate. You sought for it and you got it. The people gave it to you. So uh, apart from uh, the wrong persons being put in office, Mm -hmm. There are also those factors, which in a way become ex 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 escape routes. But of course, if you tell government, if you say you are in government, then you said, but many people do see ex express that they are even as worse dry areas than that. Mm -hmm. But they have interventions, and then you talk of irrigation and all this and all that. So, but as I said, a 
apart from the wrong passions, we have such act of, uh, of nature that comes in place. We have already talked of external factors, mm. uh, with the latest being Ukraine and all that. But even earlier, before we had the institutional framework of external factors, like the loan, like the market itself, which you don't determine. For example, for a long time we have been saying we, uh, we don't want to send raw products because we lose so much. Mm. And yet you find some other arguments from the buyers because we're talking free economy. The buyer is saying, no, I don't want to buy finished products. Yeah. <clears throat> the aspect of outside external forces is that of late we have had the discussion that we don't want to export raw products because we lose much more value. But we are talking of a liberal international economy mm. where it is free buyer, free seller. The buyers come up and say, no, much as you're interested in selling finished products, for me, a buyer mm. from Germany, I want raw coffee. Mm. Mm. So are you going to force the person to say, no, you must buy raw coffee? So then you find yourself into a situation of saying, okay, if you want raw coffee, I leave you. I will look for somebody who wants finished product, some supermarket. But in the process, you have met challenges. Mm -hmm. You have either delayed or you have even got the number of supermarkets that would want your finished product, not in the quantity that would help this farmer. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the impact is on the farmer. Mm -hmm. So not only in the persons, I, I'm just trying to illustrate a point that we have multiplicity of challenges. Mm -hmm. But all said and done is that the government has the mandate we sort it from the people mm. through an election. So we also have now to look at it from the point of view that to every problem, there's a solution, even HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. So where is that brain to click the right knob? And this is a challenge to government mm. that notwithstanding the challenges, if you can't meet the challenge, then step aside. Step aside yes. But exactly. as long as you're there as government, mm -hmm. the problems are there, to every problem, there's a solution. Or even at the very least, where you fail to do it, bring it out and say, we have done this, we have failed, but we shall continue tackling. Mm. And I think that's the spirit uh, we have. But of course, not embedded in every cadre level of government. We would imagine, I, I know for sure, at the cadre level of the president, it's fine. Is it manifested at a lower level of, say, cabinet and downwards and other implementers? So the, 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 the bandage still falls. Uh, much as I've said, it's not only on the placement of the person executing mm. other factors. It is not to run away from the challenge. To every problem, there's a solution. It's only how our mind clicks. Mm. So there we are. Interesting. I, I'll get back to that as we, we, we're almost tending towards a conclusion. But I want to bring on Joanita. Uh, how far have you gone in engaging government? You always have conversations with them in, in, in ensuring that uh, at least you, you, you have these, uh, these uh, constituents cushioned from these, uh, these uh, shocks of, of poverty that keep coming. We've had quite a number of engagements, especially engagements on... Um, on um, economic issues that come up whereby you see, uh, for example, the VC mm. coffee company coming in to monopolize. Mm. So we are addressing those um, trade distorts in general that mm. have an impact at the end of the day on the MSME, on the person trying mm. to compete for the market. Mm. But also <laughs> trying to ensure that um, we advocate for government to support increased aggregate demand mm. for the products manufactured by our MSMEs mm. so that they can also benefit and fully utilize the domestic markets. Mm. And also we are engaging government on putting policies in place whereby we, we see the national markets now being supermarkets. There's quite a number of supermarkets but mm. when we investigate the supermarkets and the products that they are selling you'll find that majority of these products are imported products mm. so what policies are in place yes. to ensure that these supermarkets in place are actually supportive 
of the mm. local, local pro products. Yeah, yeah, of the local products. So um, uh, we are advocating for government to put in place a supermarket policy that gives a, a, a big, a bigger percentage, about forty percent, of seeing the local products on shelves. Mm. And then we are also looking at the bubu policy. Let it not just stay on paper. It's a very good policy that we think would be supportive of the nationals to be able to benefit by Uganda, build Uganda. How much do we ensure that our national domestic markets are mainly filled with Ugandan products? Mm -hmm. But also, um, we not just addressing the ministry, ministries, but also looking at departments like UNBS. We have, I, I think also in today's newspaper, Monitor comes out clearly and says 50% of the Ugandan products, 54% of the Ugandan products are poor, uh, 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 yes, poor quality. So how do we address issues of poor quality products? But also how do we not just put the blame on mm -hmm. the MSMEs having poor quality products, but also looking at the raw materials on the market being counterfeit? Mm -hmm. We look at the, the, the fertilizers and their counterfeits. We look at pesticides being counterfeits. And at the end sure. of the yeah. day, this has an impact on the farmer who is planting yeah. because contamination now starts right at that stage. So that is the, those are the scenarios where you'll find um, goods crossing the borders. And for example, Kenya will say that the maize is contaminated. It has aflatoxins, whereby you'll find them um, rejecting the latter milk because of poor standards at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And when we investigated this, it was actually not a political issue like we had deemed it, but actually the products were not meeting the standards. Mm -hmm. But you'll find that when you, when you trace the issues, where, where, where is that, this issue of standards? How come Ugandan products are failing? to meet the, the, the market requirements yeah. as they cross borders, you'll find that actually contamination starts right from the farmers. Yeah. So how do we ensure yeah. that actually there's proper seed, quality seed on the market, and it's not GMOs? How do we ensure that the fertilizers and pesticides in place are still of quality? Yeah. But also how do we build the capacity of the farmers to be able to identify the counterfeits or to use organic, to prioritize organic fertilizers rather than looking at chemicals, agrochemicals that are harmful most of the time. Mm. So um, we are involving government in that way, but also working with them, Ministry of Trade especially, to bring as many MSMEs on board mm. to ensure that such discussions happen that they are not new to these discussions, yeah. that they start adopting the practices. But also the fact that um, now Uganda has ratified for some of the market, of, of, of big market agreements like the AFCFTA. The AFCFTA has rolled out, when you ratify and hand over the tools, the instruments, that means that you can start trading and you're open to trading. That means that other countries are going to come in, take over the domestic markets, or oh, that is what maybe we are seeing, whereby we see more imported products in mm. and competing with our own. So what is the export preparedness of our own MSMEs at the mm. end of the day? Mm. So here we call for government to increase, to, to, to invest again in our capacity building, awareness creation about the availability of these market opportunities, mm -hmm. but also preparing MSMEs to ensure that they benefit. UNBS is the one supposed to certify these MSMEs, but how are they prepared for the standardization? Mm -hmm. Because one of the, of the challenges that keeps coming out strongly by the MSMEs is that um, the high cost of production. And one of them being formalization, being of high cost, certifying high laboratory costs, mm. um, high test costs, and even just getting the QMAC is, is expensive. Mm. So how does government, you know, we were talking about incentives and doctor was saying something about it. What government should do a needs assessment. Mm. Of course, Ministry of Trade has done some work around this identifying the needs of the MSMEs mm. by involving them. What are their needs and how can they address, how can they support? How do they 
how does the budget now, when you look at the budget allocation, how much is allocated to UNBS mm. to be able to subsidize these costs for the I MSMEs guess. to ensure that they benefit in mm. standards. Mm. But also, um, when we look at the policies, we look at um, the uh, domestic revenue that is lost in terms of uh, the market I mean, the tax incentives that are offered to the investors that come in, the foreign direct investors. Mm -hmm. So this, in a way, impact on the revenue that government would have instead used to support its nationals. Mm -hmm. the, the, the stretched, is it really the solution? So some of those are the interventions whereby we bring government on board to, you know, to, 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 to address the challenge in um, providing these stretched so many years tax incentives to foreign direct investors because their issue is not, they have money actually. Mm -hmm. And we don't think that their issue is about paying taxes. Paying taxes yes. There are so many other ways they can provide incentives other than exempting them from taxes mm -hmm. that could have a big contribution to debt payment, debt repayment, that could have a big contribution to public service delivery for the government. Is there any way they can incentivize investors other mm -hmm. than exempting the taxes. So when we, we, we bring them on board and show them the tax and revenue loss that mm -hmm. we, are fa we are facing as we are giving them these exemptions. Mm -hmm. But also um, another thing that we are calling upon government for is to address the, the bills that are pending in Parliament, we have the competition bill. The competition bill is very pertinent because it addresses um, issues of monopoly, issues like the Vinci company that was coming in to now take over the coffee industry where mm. farmers had actually formed cooperatives and we are looking at coffee as one of the way of economic growth. Mm. And you see a company coming in to negotiate the prices for them. Mm. These are people who have been in processes of forming cooperatives, groups to work in value chains. We are supporting them into, into um, building their capacities to value addition, to ensure that they now participate in more gainful trade. But then we are seeing one company taking over. So how do we put in policies in place to reduce such such gaps mm. and inconsistencies where you see a foreign director invest a foreign investor coming in to take over. Yeah, interesting. I'll, uh, I'll thank you very much for, for, for that. I, I'm sure, uh, Doctor, you'll have uh, some response in that line. But uh, as we are, uh, this should be the last question I'm sending to you. We know that, uh, of course, uh, COVID-19 uh, greatly impacted on the economy sure. and uh, could be uh, one of uh, the, the, the reasons that uh, probably our, 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 our poverty uh, uh, poverty uh, rates have, have a little skyrocketed, but also we have uh, the, the 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 shocks that we've talked about, the external shocks that have affected the economy now, and uh, everyone is really affected. Probably, I would want to ask, uh, and this is a it's a conversation that has been ongoing. We just need to have uh, a take from you. What do you think government should do? Well, the president has come out clearly and said. He, whatever he said, yeah, government has no much uh, it can do. You, what, what do you think would be the best advice that would allow us probably come out of uh, this this uh, situation? Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, adding on the conversation we are mm. having, really, sometimes the best way to approach a problem mm. is to recognize the problem and then look at your options. Mm. Don't do things because they appear nice to do. Are they practically feasible? And I think that's why a fund here was raising the issues. Mm. You, you really would desire to add value to your coffee. Yes. But the guy who buys your coffee says, don't bring it processed. And he has his own reasons. And you can't argue with them because you are not going to eat your coffee. This is not rice right that if you don't buy it, I will eat it myself. Mm. We grow coffee for export. We're trying to promote local consumption, but won't get there easily. So you want to observe these realities mm. to begin with. Where are my options? They may have their own reasons. If you are going to take maize to Kenya and it has aflatoxin, maybe I can have a way of removing the aflatoxin if you said it to me raw. Mm. 
Mm. If you are going to bring it already processed into powder, I have a problem. Mm. So if I can't trust your system to deliver quality product to me, give me the raw material and I begin mm -hmm. from there. Mm -hmm. They may have a reason. Mm. So in the meantime, you realize, okay, until I improve my quality, I need to engage differently at this point in time. Mm. So let's not jump out there and say, how do we get out of this problem? If we are going to come up with idealistic solutions, we are going to take longer, or we may never even recover, mm. or we'll even be hit hardest. The mighty America, Biden went down to the Middle East and wanted an increase in oil. We believe it's one of the conversations he put out there. Mm. Yesterday they responded to his need. And this is OPEC plus 22 countries that dominate the oil industry. They simply said, oh, we are going to add you more 100,000 barrels a day. Now they have withheld 10 million barrels per day. So they have only given him an increase of 1%. Mm. Surely it's not going to answer the question. But you start there. So if the whole world is still having a shortfall of 100 million barrels, uh, 10 million barrels per day, mm. oil prices are not going to come down. Can we take that fact? And the other fact we are saying, we are going into winter in the northern countries. Mm -hmm. They are going to demand more oil. So the price for oil is going to go mm -hmm. higher. higher. Mm -hmm. Can we resolve that? Don't cap. Don't give a subsidy there because mm -hmm. you are really fighting against a storm. Yes. You won't win that war. Find other ways on how do you realign yourself. We are having a shortage of food. Schools are going back to open. They are closing a week earlier, some of them two weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. I can see them closing even a longer period earlier next time. Because we are just in the planting season. We don't have seed. But we won't even harvest in the next three, four months until December. Yes, the schools that open in September close in December. When food harvest will still not be there. So as night follows day, they are going to increase fees. But even then, they will struggle to find the food. Mm -hmm. And remember, that is a time when we have candidate classes sitting their final exams. Mm -hmm. So are we already planning for these things? Sometimes we face challenges because we haven't done our own planning. Mm -hmm. You would want the Ministry of Education to come up with scenario B. Mm -hmm. In the event food does not come through well, the term yeah, for the non-candidate classes will not be 14 weeks. It will be 10. So how do I intend to recover? But don't wait to get surprised. Because mm -hmm. that's the reality. Mm -hmm. Because you want the candidate classes to run up to the end, finish their syllabus, and do the exams. So who is thinking through those? Mm -hmm. So I think some of our biggest shortfall, we may blame the global dynamics and the local weather patterns. And the, Have we done adequate planning? In the event this doesn't happen, what do I do? Mm. In economics, everybody of us carries some emergency money. Even when you are planning to walk, you carry some money and say, in the event, it is chaos in town. I will jump on a border. border. Mm -hmm. If the border doesn't, you will walk. But how are we doing our planning with that flexibility, with that insight of all the options that might happen? I think this is what will hit us more if we continue business as usual. Mm -hmm. We have said it before. <laughs> If COVID has really undermined your budget, if the cost of living is rising, what should be the priorities? Maybe this is not the time to sign on a contract for upgrading a new road to Tamak. Mm -hmm. Let's deal with the contracts we have. That road provide for grading and maram. Keep it motorable mm -hmm. for the next two years. If there is a transmission line we haven't done, a power dam we haven't signed on, this is time to share of them. You don't continue building a house when you have a sick child in the home. You suspend. Mm. It is certainly going to affect somebody who was selling cement because his business is gone. But I'm mining myself. Mm. Mm. I'm not mining about the cement seller. I am saying my children need to go back to school. So that's priority number one. Food mm. and medicine. I can even afford the comfort of a house like this where I was. Mm. My income is not rising. I find another cheaper house. But I'm looking at the long term. So when I look at the government budget, security is going to remain fundamental. Let's not forget we have a war in our neighborhood. Criminality is rising. You want to keep it, nip it in the bud. Mm. So security costs in this country will continue. Continue rising, yeah. Educational costs, you're not about to tell children stay home. That budget is going to continue. Mm. Health budget is going to continue. All these other things are going to continue. What else can we mute? We need to get into that conversation. Mm. Don't just keep borrowing. 
there are certain things you can mute. I sometimes want to discuss with members of parliament and say, can't you discuss fewer days? Because some of the allowances are pegged on the regular conversations that are there. Even when parliament goes in recess, they all resort to committees, which do not respect the recess. So they are still active. Can we have this conversation? And say, can we do Zoom? I remember they did Zoom under COVID. <laughs> A few would come, few. others yes. would be home. Yes. So COVID has taught us alternatives. Can mm. we mainstream these alternatives? And say, members of parliament, can you cut 20% of your budget without compromising the work? Mm. Other institutions, where can we find ways of doing things? And for me, this is really the conversation that we haven't brought out. We are in hard stress, fuel costs will continue to rise. Me and you can leave the car home. Mm. Police is not going to stop patrolling because fuel costs have gone up. Meaning I must add double the budget to the police. Because a liter was 4,000, it might reach 8,000. 8, that police needs the five liters to do that job. Mm. Double their budget. Security agencies, we still need that operation. It's now more expensive. Medical doctors. They still need to go to the facility. Mm -hmm. So what else can I tone down? That conversation is yet to come through government. And until we have that conversation, we are postponing mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah. Thank That's you. critical for me. Mm. Interesting. And uh, just into the, the closure, <coughs> our time is fast spent. I just want us to just have uh, our quick thoughts on uh, what we think should be the way forward. To, to to ensure that at least government looks through <laughs> these and uh, can work towards them to 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 respond to the to the current ch challenges on, on poverty and deprivation I, I want to start with uh, with uh, Juanita here and probably will end with uh, with uh, Afandi. Hmm. okay um In about uh, one minute one minute but, uh, yeah. uh, yes uh, yes government should involve stakeholders. Hmm to make sure that they have targeted responses to the needs of the stakeholders, not sit in closed rooms and design responses for them that actually they won't benefit from. That's one. Mm. Government is really focusing on short-term mm. responses. Mm. But like Doctor said, how do we plan? Let us look at mid-term, let us look at long-term. And because, like he said, the, the crisis is are still continuing because mm. one informs the next mm. and then the mm. next. Mm. But now what do we do to ensure that we have long-term responses to caution? But also reminding the government that it is their mandate. They can't run away from it. The president should, as he's doing the continued presidential addresses, we're having one every week, mm. what new... Mm. What new solution does he have to give the public? Mm. What, let him be in love with his citizens. Let him not be so mean and just say, I can't do anything mm. about it. Because they are focusing on him and looking at him for solutions. But also the fact, um, the, the issue of indebtedness, let us stop. Government should really look at alternatives around borrowing. Mm. Because the main problem and the fact that government is, has become very stringent to addressing uh, its citizens and, and, and the challenges they're facing is because they're focusing on debt repayments mm. rather than cautioning mm. the, the citizens. So some of those should be where our focus mainly should be. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joanita. Uh, Dr. Ari? No, I think mine is really the summer abroad. Let's mm. be realistic, let's be sober. And as she has mentioned, if you are head of the family or mother, mm. whatever it is, you're responsible for children and you have no food, it pays at least to come out and say, this is the problem. At this point, I'm unable to solve it. Mm. But this is my plan. Let them be part of the plan. At least oh. understanding the way mm. out. The <coughs> way to the fees, so you're not going back to school because I can't find the fees. Mm. Let this child not roam around hoping, what is wrong with mommy? Has she yes, abandoned me? Exactly. You tell the child, mm. for now we can't find it, but we can shift schools. Mm. There's that neighboring school, and you want to convince the child to say, it's as good as the others. Mm. Sometimes I find people, oh, my child couldn't go to Budo, and I'm like, you guys, I, Let teach, them go to I teach students <laughs> in university. <laughs> I know where the students come from. Exactly. Not all of them are from, from Budo. Mm. Yes. There are people coming from all these schools. Yeah. So please go there. If you have your brain and focus, you will get that result you need. Mm. 
Gone are the days in our times when schools were not there. I never went to any school for LF because I had to scavenge where there was a good teacher. Mm -hmm. So much of it was coaching, but also I couldn't afford the real school to pay. I would only pay my teachers when the course is hard. So you want to have that conversation with this stakeholder. To say, I mind about you, but this is how I want us to go about it. So mm -hmm. how do we get out of this? Mm -hmm. Let's involve everybody. Let's not begin to guess why are doctors not giving me my drug. When the doctors come and tell you, you know, we're still giving you blood and mm. glucose because you are <coughs> anemic and malnourished. Mm. The treatment will start on Wednesday. Okay. Then you follow them. Mm. Sometimes they give you a drug, they should give you a little bit of nausea and drowsiness. Otherwise, the moment they feel I'll soak the drug. But mm. if they had alerted me, so her point is very clear. Let's involve the population in the solutions. Interesting, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, finally, uh, uh, which, uh, recently the president is now on to uh, by weekly, almost by weekly conversations with the country. Can we see to them that at least yet, like the one tomorrow, he could really offer solutions that are really biting uh, the people? We hope so. Uh, we hope so, and he's committed, and I, I hope he has all the machinery at his disposal to do that in terms of the experts surrounding him. But I still wanted to think that I should have closed on the question on the table, the poverty, mm -hmm. what government should, should do. Uh, but before that, I just want to mention, to add on the quality aspect, we, we may lose out on the quality. Take, for example, European Union. For a long time, they have accepted fish from Lake Victoria. Mm. You know why they did it? And it is the only thing almost Uganda was known in the supermarket of Europe. Where you go to a supermarket and look for items to buy, you only get Ugandan fish from Lake Victoria. Why? Because they funded from the catching of the yeah. fish mm. to the transportation in a, a boat to the factory handling. Mm up to the aircraft. Mm. Yeah. So they monitored the yeah, quality yeah. and then they were convinced that yes, this fish was caught rightly and it is good quality. So it affects us and we should get ways of adherence to quality. Mm. Uh, all said is that I am saying the mandate of government is to ensure that people are not poor. It's a right, it's a basic right and it is good that we have had the multidimensional approach Mm. It puts us exactly where we are. And UBOS, of course, is a government branch. It looks like it is independent. I wish it continues that independence so that data are not doctored. Mm. Facts speak exactly. for itself yeah. and figures don't lie. Mm. Uh, I know in European countries like Sweden, they also talk of poverty, child poverty, for example. So therefore, my only conclusion is government is putting in a lot of resources out there. Please, I come back to the discipline of card assembly. Mm. All this we have been putting to eradicate poverty will go down to the waste. If you have planned to give efforts to the to the family and on the third rich and even younger than the ones you have targeted and they die earlier. Because if you plan to be, buy a 22-month-old if and you buy for 15, mm. they will die. Mm. So my strongest recommendation even within the party and that we shall insist because now we are going to the party to have periodic review of government actions because we gave you minutes of health to do this when we are talking during campaign how far have you done mm. gone so mm. as a party we are trying to say look government monitor resource leakage mm. you will put so much it is useless to plan to buy 100 IFAs and you buy only 30. Mm. 70 has gone to somebody's pocket. It will not take us out of poverty. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fande. And of course, uh, thank you very much, uh, my dear panelists, for coming today, for honoring the invitation. Uh, let's keep these conversations going. And always uh, be around and available for, for us to inform our, our viewers out there on Civic Space TV. But also, we are hopeful that uh, probably Let's 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 uh, hope that uh, pro the, the 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 address tonight of the, the president will uh, respond to some of uh, these challenges that are happening around. Not only reactionary, probably on the other things like you know, I know you talk about the floods and all this, but we need uh, responses on the poverty, mm -hmm. these uh, long-lasting uh, uh, issues that are affecting us on a daily.
let's have and uh, of course like uh, we just said if we can tame the the, the misbehavior of the cadres probably uh, we could see something coming out of the country and uh, here from us uh, the civic space tv the crew uh, we say thank you for being a part of this conversation and also thank you for following your comments uh, we'll meet uh, next friday may god bless uganda <music>